Uh, so Father Matthias is the president of Encounter Ministries and pastor of St. Patrick Church in Brighton, Michigan. He is both a graduate of St. John Vianney College Seminary and of the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he earned his bachelor's in philosophy and Catholic studies. He attended Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit for his graduate seminary formation and after graduation was ordained a priest on June 11, 2010 for the Diocese of Lansing. He's the author of the book, Biblical Foundation for the Role of Healing and Evangelization, and has appeared in both the Fearless Documentary and the upcoming Revived Documentary. So guys, please give a big Genesis welcome to Father Matthias. sports 
We actually were pretty good. And so me and my brothers poured our hearts into baseball, poured our hearts into basketball, into football. And then as I grew up, I, I began to be, just like with my brothers, really bad in school. I mean, not just bad, like, academically. I'm saying we were class clowns, and we almost got kicked out of school multiple times, right? We would do the craziest pranks, but also the most insidious things to people. Because in large part, we were looking for love. But we didn't have it. All the praise that we got from doing, uh, from playing baseball, from playing football, all the things that we got, we thought we had what it took until we struggled. And that's when I was tested. When I got into high school, what did I do? Rather than know who I was, I threw myself into girls. I dated at a very young age and dated often. Some of long, long-term relationships as well. Like, you know, it wasn't all kind of in a negative sense, but I threw my heart into that, but deep down I was miserable. And I was living in fear. Constantly afraid of what people thought of me and constantly afraid of whether or not I had what it took. Senior year of high school, I had a, a youth minister who took me, uh, let me just put it, put it this way, a youth minister who left the seminary, who started, uh, I'm sorry, a man who left the seminary, who started a youth group. And I was in high school, my friend was saying, hey Matthias, come over here into this youth group where we can learn about Jesus. And like, yeah, no way. I'm not going to that. I mean, I, again, I was, I was playing baseball and football. I didn't care about God. I went to Mass every Sunday, but I didn't really care about God until he started telling me, he's like, hey, there are, there are cute girls there. How can you come? And I said, okay. Whatever gets you in the door, right? So I went there, and I heard the gospel for the first time in a way that blew me away. Because I had a priest that I didn't really relate to and I didn't really understand who God was and he began to challenge me, if God is real, if he really loves you, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to respond? So he took me to a conference called the Steubenville Youth Conference in Steubenville. How many of you have heard of Steubenville Youth Conferences? Excellent. Okay, put your hands down. I was a senior in high school. And I was invited to go to this conference. And at this conference during the Saturday night adoration, the priest, comes, the, the priest is preaching the gospel. And he's saying, this is who God reveals himself to be. A loving father who loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us in our suffering and pain and in our, in our really basically into the condemnation of death. But he wants to enter into that to transform us to, so that we can live as his beloved sons and daughters. All you have to do is you have to repent and believe in that gospel, and he will come with the, through the power of the Holy Spirit and change your life. So as he's preaching this gospel, he's just saying, what is your response? So I'm praying. The priest comes with the blessed sacrament. He's walking around the room blessing people. He gets to me and I start weeping uncontrollably. Now, how many men love weeping in front of girls that they like? Just how many, just how comfortable, I mean, how many, was that a hand? Okay. <laughs> so this is embarrassing for me, right? I start weeping and sobbing because as the priest came by, I knew that I knew that God loved me. I knew that I knew that, that God was my father, that all of my sins were completely forgiven. And at that moment, something happened. I knew that God was real. My brothers and sisters, or my brothers, there's no sisters here, I don't think, right? <laughs> we live in a world which many people don't know God is real. They hear the gospel that God loves you, and they dismiss it. They dismiss it in many ways because what's going on in their hearts is that they've heard something the opposite their whole life. You see, God, God can't love me because I haven't done this or I've done this. Or God can't love me because I, I don't feel that I'm good enough. So as Jesus broke into my life, I began to realize that what I was trying to accomplish on my own was something that he had accomplished for me. You see, I was trying to make myself good enough. I was trying to make myself um, have what it takes in order to be loved. And my, my simple exhortation this morning, or this afternoon, sorry, 
is that the Father loves you, and there's nothing you can do about that. You can't take that away. You can say no to that love, but you can't take it away from you. That no matter what has happened in your life, no matter how difficult your life has been, no matter how much pain is in your life, no matter how hopeless you are, God the Father loves you. My brothers, if we don't understand this, it doesn't matter how many talks we have that pump us up to, be, to live good lives in Christ. It doesn't matter. We're not going to have what it takes. Because unfortunately, we're living in a world in which too many fr- men are afraid to lead, afraid to take risks, afraid to be fathers, to be brothers. And that fear is crippling us. And it cripples us in many ways because we're trying to secure in our own selves who we are. In other words, if we we don't know who you are in the Father, you're not able to be the man that you are called to be. It's just not possible. What happens if you don't know who you are? You try to make yourself somebody. You try to accomplish your identity, by achievements and performance. How do I know this is true? Is what, look what happens when you fail. You try to do something, you try to, you try to, maybe it's school, maybe it's work, maybe it's try to provide for your family, and when you fail, what happens in your heart? You see, for some time, for some people, there's a kind of a crisis of identity that happens because they put their identity in their work. I see this all the time as a priest. People who are successful, people who have a relatively secure life, when they put their identity in their work, when something happens with that work, it all falls apart. And they begin to ask the question, well, who am I? You see, putting our identity in anything other than God will lead us to living in fear. Because if if our identity is based on what we do, then it all depends on us. So many men that I know struggle with hopelessness and struggle with fear because they feel like they always have to have it together. They always got to do what, they always got to do it just right. That if they make a mistake, they become filled with fear and anxiety. The other thing is, is some guys, rather than the fear of failure, some people are just afraid of rejection. They have to always be liked by others. And we as men don't like to admit this. We don't like to admit how, how insecure that we can be, but if we are doing something, maybe, maybe giving ourselves to the Lord, maybe trying to live our faith, and some of our friends don't like that, some of our friends are really against that, we sometimes aren't really honest with ourselves about how much that really impacts us. Because our identity is wrapped up in what other people think about us. If you don't believe that, Watch what happens when you challenge a friend in his faith or you challenge someone else to live a different life. Watch what happens in your heart. If that is easy for you, then I would say praise God or you should probably care more about other people and making sure that you're not hurting them. But I would say that one of the reasons why we know this is that when we challenge others and we are rejected, it begins to cause us to be afraid. And what I'm suggesting today is that it's precisely the love of God that causes us to be free from the judgments of others, to be free from a performance mentality that would cause us to be afraid. Now, I don't know about you, but when, when I fail in something, I sometimes can be, try to hide from others or hide from God. How many of you have had that experience where you make a huge mistake and you, you really don't want anyone else to know about it. Just raise your hand. You make a mistake, you don't want anyone else to know about it. Okay. That's exactly what happens. We try to hide. We try to withdraw from God. We try to withdraw from others. And what we tend to sometimes believe is not just I made a mistake, it's I am a mistake. I'm no good. I should be able to do this. I should be stronger than this. When we start to buy into those types of lies, we really, really begin to struggle in our faith, 
and we, we begin to f- struggle in our relationships. God loves you. The Father loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. And this is really, really good news. And I want to encourage you, just remember this. Why is it that when we come to Jesus, he takes all of that away from us? And this is very important. Why is it that when we come to Jesus, he's able to take away our guilt, he's able to take away our fear, he's able to take away our insecurity, and he's able to strengthen us so that we know that we have what it takes? It's simply because of this. In Jesus, we become the Father's beloved sons. Period. You see, when sin broke into the world, we were separated from God. And there was nothing we could do to earn a relationship with God because we already owe God everything. Yet when God sends Jesus, he says, let me pay that debt. And he takes all of our sin and our brokenness upon himself. He places himself in our place and then he gives all of that to the Father. And what the Father has given to him, he gives to each of us. You see, Jesus has become one with us so that we get what he deserved and he gets what we deserved. Jesus deserves life because he is the perfect son of the Father. We deserve death because of our sin. He gives us this great exchange where he takes all of our sin and our brokenness and our death upon himself. He takes what we deserve and gives to us what, we de- what he deserved and that is his relationship with the Father. In other words, you are a beloved son of the Father. You who have been redeemed by him. This is something that as Christians, we need to really, really celebrate and thank God for what he's doing. So, how can we come to know this love? I'm just going to give you five basic steps by which we can come to know this this love of the Father. And some of this is going to be reviewed for you. Some of this is going to be new for you. But these five steps are critically important for us as men to step into so that we can receive his love. Number one, come to Jesus in humility and faith. Come to Jesus in humility first. When we come to God, we come to God knowing our need for him. One of the greatest lies that we struggle with today is that we do not need God. We do not need him. We can live on our own. We can come up with our own system of government. We can come up with our own system of life. We don't need to have a relationship with God. That's an absolute lie. He's holding us into existence right now. And so when we come to Jesus, we have to say, Lord, I need you. It's a fundamental disposition of the heart. And as men, this is a very difficult disposition to have at times. We can really rebel against this. We don't want to depend on God. We don't want to depend on a relationship. We want to have what it takes And oftentimes, if we act as if we don't need God, we make ourselves God. So every time we come to God, we say, God, I need you. Very simple. I need you. I need your mercy. I need your love. I need your power. I need you. That's that first disposition and humility. But to have humility and faith. Faith is believing in who God says we are. Believing in who he says he is and who he says we are. To come into God's presence and say... Lord, I believe that you love me. I believe that I'm loved by you. I believe that you are, you are here to forgive me. I believe that you're for me and not against me. You see, when we come into God's presence and we believe something false about him, most likely we're not going to have a relationship with him. If I come into God's presence and I believe that God is angry at me, that God is judging me, that God is, is really disappointed in me, I'm probably not going to open my heart up to him. But if I believe that he's He's really laboring to love me. God, I need you, and I know that you're here, and I give you permission to love me right now. And I ask that you come and you forgive my sin. What happens? My heart opens up that a relationship might happen. Prayer can be some of the hardest things that we do in, as Christians. There's a battle for prayer. But if we come to prayer knowing that we need him and believing that he is for us and not against us, he is our savior, that he's gentle and merciful toward us, 
then we will want to come to him in prayer. So that's the first thing. Come to Jesus in humility and faith. Number two, we come to Jesus repenting for closing our hearts to him. When we choose not to believe in his love for us, when we choose to reject him, we end up turning away from the very love that we are desiring. And this is very important because sometimes we end up believing lies about ourselves that prevent him from loving us. As men, when we believe that God has called us to be someone that we're not, and when we're failing in that, we can begin to believe that we're not good enough for this. And we need to repent of that. We need to turn away from the lies in which we believed about ourselves and about God. And we need to repent from trying to save ourselves, trying to rely on ourselves. We need to repent from living out of fear. Too many of us will live out of fear without recognizing what God is calling us to. We need to repent from that. We need to repent for rebelling against God and his plan for our life. One of the biggest temptations is to believe that somehow God's will for us is bad for us, or God's will for us is going to cause us to be miserable. We need to repent from that because God is good. Oftentimes, the desires of our hearts, the the, the real um, seeking of God, the, the, the love, the joy, the peace, all that stuff comes from him. And if we believe that his will is going to cause us to be really miserable, then we're going to turn our hearts from him. We need to repent of that. Say, God, I believe in you. I believe that you come to satisfy me. So we need to repent. Number three, we need to come to Jesus forgiving those who have hurt us. This is huge. You know that all grace that comes to you comes in the form of mercy? You don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything. And especially Father Larry doesn't deserve anything. We don't deserve anything. Everything that God gives to us comes to us in the form of mercy. And Jesus is very clear. If we do not forgive others, we will not be forgiven. And every time we come into prayer, we need to say, Lord, um, I forgive these people or this person or this, this. I forgive in your name. Because oftentimes we hold up walls in our hearts you ever know some, a man who gets angry easily? Who he has a short temper? Who always is frustrated? Who get, beats himself up? Hates others? Oftentimes, such men hold on to unforgiveness in their hearts. And the worst part about unforgiveness, it is not just a wall to other people, it's a wall to God himself. We put up this wall of self-protection and most of the time people are angry because they've been hurt. But if we're not man enough to acknowledge that, if we're not man enough to say we need to let this wall down, we're going to keep not just others out, we're going to keep God out and we're going to make ourselves miserable. And so every time we come to Jesus, we have to be willing to forgive those who have hurt us. I can't tell you how many times in my own life It's precisely when I began to forgive that God began to to pour his love into my heart. You see, I had that experience in Steubenville when I was a senior in high school, but it wasn't until I was in seminary that I realized I had to forgive my dad. My dad left my mom when I was six years old. She had five children. She was raising her by herself. And there's so much pain in my heart and so much pain in her heart that I didn't even know what to do with it. So I threw myself in the sports. I threw myself in the girls. I threw myself into all these other things, not realizing how much pain I had in my heart. And when I started drawing close to God, I realized i got to forgive this guy because I started to realize how evil it was that my mom and dad got a divorce. Not blaming necessarily one or the other, but it was very, very painful. And then I realized there really was anger at him. There was deep anger at him. And when I began to forgive, Jesus, do not hold his sin against him. I I choose to forgive. What started happening? God was able to come and bring healing to that place in my heart. I was able to know that the Father loved me in a deeper way. You see, if we try to believe that God loves us, but we refuse to forgive those who have hurt us, 
we're going to find ourselves stuck because everything that comes to us comes in the form of mercy. And this means that sometimes we have to acknowledge that there are certain people in our lives who should have loved us but didn't, that we need to forgive them. And it's okay to, to have to forgive a lot of people. When I first went through this, I had a whole page of people that I had to forgive. But I'm telling you, the more that I came into God's presence, I said, okay, Jesus, in your name, I forgive this person for doing this, or this person for not doing this. What began to happen, my, the walls of my heart began to come down. And that defensiveness that I had in my life, that kind of arrogance that I had in my life, that kind of pride in which I don't need this, I don't need you, that kind of, I'm going to try to one-up all the other guys in my life, that began to come down because I began to realize that if I'm having mercy on other people, I'm now allowing God to have mercy on me. And it changed everything. When we come to prayer, we have to make sure that we're forgiving the people who have hurt us because it opens our hearts to know the Father's love for us. Number four, we need to come to Jesus renouncing any of the lies we've come to believe so that we can receive his truth. One of the most common reasons why people don't believe in God, I would say men, why men don't believe in God is because somewhere along the way in their life, they began to start believing in lies through the woundedness that they have, through the brokenness of life. We live in a fallen world, and our world is, is pretty brutal. There's a lot of evil that happens. And oftentimes when we respond to evil, we begin to believe things about ourselves or about God that just simply aren't true. And if we continue to believe them, it doesn't matter if I tell you ten times right in front of you a truth, you won't believe it. In other words, in other words one of the reasons why we don't believe the word of God is because we're too busy believing someone else's word. We're too busy believing the word about ourselves. And some of these lies are wicked. And we come to believe them in difficult places. When I was young, I saw my mom weeping and crying after my dad left. And as a little boy, I didn't know what to do because I was in pain that my dad left. She was in pain. So I basically made this inner vow, I'm never going to allow myself to be weak again. I must be strong. And because of that, every time that I experienced a weakness later in life, I began to get very insecure and filled with fear. I began to believe that I had to be strong at every moment because if I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't loved. I wasn't lovable. See, one of the things that caused me when I was younger to, to want to be a good man was to, to please the women in my life, to show them that I was good enough as a man. What was I trying to do? I was trying to prove not just to them but to myself that I had what it took. But what that did is it prevented me from believing that God loved me. That was a place of unbelief in my heart. And so Jesus took me back there at one point in prayer, and he showed me that, that he was there with me, that Mary was there with me, that I didn't have to believe this about myself anymore. And it set me free to know the Father's love for me. There were some men probably in this church who believe that they're no good, who believe that they're, they're too weak, there's some men who believe that they've been abandoned, that, that no one understands them, no one cares for them. They believe that they're dirty, they're broken, they're worthless. These lies are been, have been planted by the enemy in our heart. And we need to be able to and be willing to renounce them, to say, in the name of Jesus, I choose not to believe these because I choose to believe your word about me. I choose to believe that I am your beloved, that I am your son, that I have what it takes because of what you've done for me in Jesus. Because that changes everything. The number one reason why men live in fear is because they don't know who they are. And one of the top reasons why we don't know who we are is because we're not listening to God, we're listening to these lies. So we have to acknowledge them, we have to renounce them so that we can allow God to speak his truth to us. Because again, when you believe a lie, you empower the liar. And if I speak a truth to you, no matter how many times I say it to you, if you believe something else in the, de in the depths of your heart that contradicts that truth, you will not believe it. You won't believe it. This is one of the reasons why the Pharisees and the scribes could see miracles right in front of their face about who Jesus was, and they did not believe him. 
wasn't the lack of evidence. It was what they were caught up in a web of lies in their own hearts. The same with God in our culture and our society. We can have all the evidence in the world about God and his love and his existence, but if there is a culture of, of guys who are believing lies about themselves and lies about God because of woundedness in their hearts, they're not going to see God. And in order for us to have a church that is renewed, we need to, our, we need to have ourselves renewed in the truth. And then we need to reject what is false and give God a chance to reveal himself through his word. Number five, we come to Jesus letting go of control, asking Jesus to reveal the Father's love and the power of the Spirit. We can't foster or manufacture, we can't manufacture or make an encounter of God with God happen. We can't control God. God is mysterious. He's beyond all of our control. And on the one hand, that causes some insecurity in us. This is one of the reasons why we don't want to let go of control is because we're no longer in control. Let me repeat that. One of the reasons why we don't want to let go of control is because we're no longer in control. We don't know what it's like to not be in control as men. But I'm telling you, unless you allow yourself to let go of control, you'll never know the love of God that, that sustains you into existence. And it's precisely when we say, God, I give you everything. I let, go of com I let go of everything, and I give you permission to love me. That's when he begins to work in a very powerful way. If you want control of your life, you have no business being a Christian. But if you want the Father of love who created you and sustained you into existence to have his way, and you want that love and that power to come into your life in a new way, it's precisely through surrender to Jesus that you have that. And this is ultimately the real challenge for us as men. Do we want God to be God and to lead us, or do we want to be in charge of our life? And I don't know about you, but I know what it's like trying to live without, without God. So does Tom Namey. <laughs> hey, Tom. We know, I know what it's like to try to live without God. It's miserable. But we allow God to have his way. Something happens in us. So we have to come to God being willing to let go of control. And when we let go of control, we ask what? We ask the Holy Spirit to come. We ask the Spirit of God to reveal the love of the Father. St. Paul says that God pours into our hearts the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what? He actually says he pours into, into our hearts the love. He pours the love of God into our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit that, he has, been, that has been given to us. And that Spirit cries within us, Abba, Father. How many of you want to know in a deeper way that God is your loving Father? Just, just raise your hand. Do you want to know this? I could speak about it. I could tell you stories. I could stand here tone blue in the face, but we have to come to him. I want to pray with you. I purposely did not prepare a very long talk because I think I'm supposed to pray. I'm supposed to lead you to come to Jesus so that he can show you the Father. I'll tell you a story, though. Before we do this, I was um, in my first parish... I was praying with some of the men's groups um, there at the parish, and I was leading them in a very similar exercise of coming to Jesus and leading them through these kind of five steps. And as I was leading them there, guys were really dealing with some heavy stuff. Some of you guys here have been hurt very, very deeply. Some of you know it, and some of you haven't. Some of you don't know it yet. You, 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 aren't, you haven't acknowledged yet how much you've been hurt in your life. But as these guys were going through this, it became very difficult for them, but they, they were forgiving people that hurt them. They were choosing to renounce the lies that they were unlovable, that they were worthless, that they didn't have what it takes. And they started renouncing these lies, and then we just simply said, okay, now we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and reveal the Father. And these guys started weeping in the power of God's presence because they came to know that God loved them. And this one guy said to me, Father, I've never experienced this much love in my life. I saw how God sees me, and I have a new son. And he had a son that was only, um, I think, probably a year old at the time. And he said he saw himself 
as his son, and as much love as he had for his son, God loved him that much more. And and it changed his life, all through a simple prayer. All we're going to be doing is entering into that very place that Jesus has opened up for us through his death and resurrection. I'm going to encourage you. You don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. It's free. You can't earn something that's free. So some of you might be thinking, I'm not worthy to know the Father's love. In one sense, you're right. You're not worthy. But God has made you worthy in Jesus. This is a free gift that God has already given to us in our baptism. So I'm going to lead us through walking through our baptism so that we can come to know the Father's love in a new way. Here is the story of Jesus and his baptism. Sorry about that. I'm doing the, the Luke's version. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form as a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. So I want to lead all of us in prayer, and I want to encourage you right now just to make yourself comfortable and close your eyes. I'm going to lead you in a little prayer. So I want you to to, um, just pray this prayer after me. Come, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Just acknowledge that he's present right now. That God is close to you and he's loving you. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I believe in your love for me. I believe that you are here right now. I believe that you died for my sins and that you rose from the dead to give me life. I give you, Jesus, permission to reveal my sin, to convict me of my sin, so that I may know your mercy. I want you to wait. As things are coming up in your mind, any sin that he wants you to let go of, I want to encourage you just under your breath to say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, I'm sorry. Or Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I'm sorry for not believing in your love. I'm sorry for trying to rely on myself and to earn your love. Let's repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, please reveal to me anyone that I need to forgive. And as people come up into your mind, I want you to just simply respond, Jesus, I forgive. Jesus, I forgive. Jesus, I forgive. 
It's okay if multiple people keep coming up in your mind. And sometimes Jesus wants, to, wants us to forgive from the place of pain, from the place of, of, where, of the hurt. So, so th- sometimes it's helpful to just allow yourself to forgive from that place uh, where it actually happened in your memory. So Jesus, I forgive. Remember that forgiveness is, is not letting someone get away with something. It's acknowledging that what they did was wrong and you choosing to release them from the debt that they owe to you or from the debt that they owe to someone else. Jesus, I forgive. So at this point, we're going to just maybe renounce some of the common lies that we tend to believe about ourselves. So I want you to just repeat after me. In the name of Jesus, name of Jesus I, renounce Satan I renounce Satan and all of his works. Of his works. I renounce all of his evil spirits. I all of his spirits. And I renounce the lie, I renounce the lie that, no one cares about me. that no one cares about me. I renounce the lie, renounce the lie that no one understands me. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, I renounce the lie lie that I am too weak, that that things will never get better. better. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, I renounce the lie lie that I am not loved, that I am not not wanted, that I am not not good enough. enough. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, I renounce the lie that I'm shameful, shameful. I'm worthless, worthless. and I'm bad. I I want you to just repeat this one prayer and I'll lead you through a meditation. In the name of Jesus, I let go of all control right now. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to reveal the Father. Pour your love into me. Just wait for him to do that. I want you to picture yourself on the the shores of the Jordan River. And John the Baptist is baptizing. There's a line of people along the side of the river. And John the Baptist takes Jesus into the water. And you see Jesus come down into the water and John the Baptist put him under the water. And then as he gets out of the water, you see this light and this dove come upon him. And you hear this voice You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And as you're stunned at what just happened, Jesus looks to everyone on the shore with great delight and with great love. And his eyes catch your eyes, and he looks at you, and he chooses you. And he summoned you to come into the water with him. I want you to respond and and get into the water with him. You come up next to him, and Jesus looks at you with great delight because he wants to share what he has received from the Father with you. And so as, he, as you give him permission, he begins to plunge you into the water, washing your old self away, your sins being washed away, 
your shame being completely buried. And you come up out of the water with him. And you no longer see him. Because he says to you, I am here with you. I am with you. I am inside of you. And you look up, there's this great light. And the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you hear the Father say to you, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. I delight in you. You are mine. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. He says you don't have to make yourself good because in me you are good. You don't have to have what it takes because in me you have what it takes. You are mine. You are mine. And whatever is happening in your heart right now, I want you to just rest there. Just pay attention to what God is doing in your heart. And say, Jesus, I want more. I want more. Just allow him to come upon you. Allow yourself to feel the Father's delight for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want you to pay attention to the hope that you're experiencing. God is moving in his own way in each of our hearts right now. But just notice the increase of hope as you hear him say that. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. That you don't have to be good because in Jesus you are good that you don't have to have what it takes because in Jesus, you have what it takes. You are mine. So Father, I thank you and I praise you for all that you're doing right now. You're sealing in the hearts of your beloved sons the truth that you are a good God, that you love us. I ask in a special way, Lord, that you take away any fear that exists in our hearts. That you replace it with your truth and the confidence that if you're for us, who can be against us? That if you're with us, we have nothing to be afraid of. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. By a show of hands right now, you guys can look up. How many of you just, just sense God loving you just right now in this time of prayer? So it's very simple, right? Those five steps, very simple. You know, I, again, you are very blessed as a community in the, in the Chaldean church. You're very blessed. You have very good priests. You have a very good support, a community of support. But no matter what happens, no matter what people say to you, 
If you aren't hearing from him who you are, you're at risk of living in fear again. You might want to go back to this place of prayer with Jesus in the water. You might want to say, Lord, tell me again who I am, because right now I'm afraid of this. Right now this is my concern, or I'm, I'm insecure about this. That's fine. And I know how difficult this is for some of you. Trust me, I know how difficult this is. The paradox is, is that in order, in order for us to be strong, we must first allow God to be strong in us. And if we're, not, if we're not able to go to prayer like this, we're not going to be strong. But when we do, the more you're willing to, to allow God to speak his love over you, the stronger you will be. I guarantee it. And you will be the man that you so, de- so desire to be. You will not live in fear anymore. Rather, you will, you will instill fear in the devil as you push him back from the lives of those whom you love. That is our call as, as beloved sons, as husbands, as fathers, as priests, is to stand in our identity as God's beloved sons because the Father loves us and we have what it takes in Jesus. And that's the good news that I feel called to share with you today. So I hope and pray this has been helpful for you and I want to continue uh, to encourage you to say yes to God and come to him every single day to be strengthened by his love. Amen.